Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that have breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Thank you, Jesus.
So come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring, we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. And I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I still the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is the house of miracles. I'm sorry. You know, there are some people in the world that will tell you that, that God moved back then, and God spoke back then, and God worked back then. But I'm here to tell you that God is moving now. God is speaking now. God is working now. And when we are not even aware of it, he's still working. There are also people in the world that will tell you that when you set your clocks ahead like this, that the preacher gets an extra hour. Okay. No, that's okay for him. I don't know if you want to listen to me for an extra hour. If you turn with me to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 7. We're going to look at just the, just the first part of this because there's a lot that's being said in this place. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Please be seated. Even the most capable and faithful among us, sin. But God is always willing to forgive us, especially when we repent. There's some things that he'll turn around for us before we even ask. But when we repent, when we ask for that forgiveness, he is just to do so. And we've all heard the, that phrase that every sinner has a past and... Uh, no, every... Every sinner has a future, and every saint has a past. Okay? 
no matter how we define what's good and bad, the Bible teaches us that anyone is capable of change with the help of God. Amen. Amen. Right? The Bible is full of histories of sinners who became saints, of outcasts who became heroes, and slaves who became princes and kings. Amen. Amen. Okay? What they all have in common is a personal encounter with God, and that is the God that transforms lives. Just one. One life changed. Two lives changed. Come on. There we go. The world tells us that our past is what defines us. The Bible tells us our God defines us. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. The world tells us our weaknesses are holding us back. But the Bible tells us that with our God, nothing is impossible. And anyone, anyone can be changed. And if you can change me, he can change anybody. I come from very stiff-necked people. The flaws and the mistakes of a non-believer can be forgiven so they can be grafted into God's family. The beauty of Christianity is the free offer of redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Scripture teaches that anyone, anyone can experience such a transformation. God's grace and forgiveness are able to tell us who genuinely repent and turn to him. It is by his death on the cross, the sins of the whole world are atoned. If you look back to the text in Joel the prophet, it talks about those that are far off. Those that are far off geographically, those that are far off in time. That one act is open to everyone. Yes. Okay? It is by his blood that we are sinless when we repent, and that is how God sees us. It is by his resurrection that we have hope for eternal life. This does not mean that we're excused uh, from living upright lives or our, uh, or our mistakes aren't important. Okay? It does mean that when we do fall into sin, we can seek forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Repentance involves turning away from sinful behavior and committing our lives again according to God's principles. I'm really good at my principles. And by by that, it's like, yeah. But God's principles, that's the standard, right? Okay. My principles are, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing a little bit better than that person. But am I comparing myself to another person? Or am I comparing myself to where God wants me to be? That's the big question. Seeking guidance and strength through prayer, reading the Bible, and surrounding ourselves with positive influences, fellowship, good mentors, right, are essential for that transformation and that continued growth and transformation. Just because you start on the path, you haven't reached the destination. Baptism is not the end. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is not the end. If anything, it's a a start of a difficult journey. Change is not always easy, and it requires a sincere desire to atone in the first place. And how does that sit with our flesh? The ability to take an honest self-inventory just to do that takes profound courage. Amen. The willingness to confront and overcome our shortcomings takes strength. It is a blessing to know that we are not doing this alone. 
Our help comes from the Holy Ghost. One thing I love about the Bible is reading how God loved and used sinful people for his glory. Right? When we read these recorded histories, it's easy to think that they never struggled or they only struggled for a moment. Well, Gideon wouldn't be hiding if it wasn't part of his character already. But we know that that's not true. We know that they were human beings. We know that they had troubles. We know that they had things going on, right? And it's one of those things. Those things didn't just happen then. They're happening now. They're happening in each of us. Everyone in the Bible had their struggles. Everyone in this sanctuary has their struggles. Everyone outside these four walls have their struggles. And what's the difference? We don't focus on them. Oh, I do. Thank you that I'm not like I used to be. God, this is what I need help with. I do focus on my struggles. But I don't need to, I don't need to focus on them on my own. I don't, need to, I don't need to have that weight on me. Right? I can lay those down at the feet of the cross, at Jesus' feet on the cross, just as easily as I can lay down that crown. Mm-hmm. You know, when that time comes, should that time come. Right? Experience is what is what this is. We know what it's like to have that, that opportunity to come before Jesus. We know what it's like to be able to, to share anything. Amen. As we were discussing in Sunday school downstairs, it's anything from stubbing your toe on, on the coffee table to they're going to foreclose on the house. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Everything can be brought to him, right? And when there's breakthrough and when we find the power of the Holy Ghost and when we find the power of Jesus working in our lives, we gain experience. And somebody in the world can say, oh, you're, you're just spending time talking to your imaginary friend. No, I have an experience. I was there when it happened. And experience is the best teacher. That's how I'm able to overcome the struggles. It's by focusing on the experience. Right? Lessons learned the hard way are lessons that we retain for life. Yes, amen. Amen. There is no textbook as effective as situations, pains, and the upcoming victory. Right. Yet there is one book from which we can learn our sure foundation. The Bible portrays its faithful heroes as normal, sinful people. There's always a couple, there's always, well, more than a couple, that we can relate to. Jacob was a deceiver. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson was a womanizer. Ruth was a foreigner. And David faked insanity to escape death. He cost 70,000 men their lives. He was an adulterer. He formulated a conspiracy to commit murder and then cover up the murder and other dark choice activities. Right? But God is always working to transform us the same as he transformed them. Right? In the Bible, we have examples of people that God has changed. And no matter how big or small the change, it's always amazing to see what God can do in someone's life. Right? God's worked on my life. There's there's no hiding that. But when I see how God is working on somebody else's life, I kind of share in that that joy, that breakthrough. Because that breakthrough that that person's having, one of these days that person's going to be able to help me. Amen. You know, you know, you talk about you know, servant leadership and, and things of that nature. Right? I would not be here without first the call of God, but without the ironing, sharpening iron that I've received from each of you. And I'm not going to go anywhere without that same type of fellowship. And I know that. 
Is that humiliating? No. Is it humbling? No, not really, because I know what my limits are. But I know how much I can gain from your strength, yes. from your abilities, from your experience with the living God. Amen. Right? Sometimes these changes are, are quiet or, or take time and things happen slowly. And it's in those situations that we learn to trust and follow God. And sometimes it's a dramatic change, something that transforms in a single moment. And that, and that lasts throughout all of the other moments. We look at Romans uh, 12 and 2. Okay? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Samaritan woman at the well. She was an outcast. Her sins, which she did not deny, defined her life. How she acted, how she avoided the rest of the community. When she went to the well, as an example of that. Okay? Her past defined who she was. And then Jesus met her. And he listened to her. And he showed her love. And most importantly... He restored her. She was changed in a moment into a profound evangelist. Romans 2 and 4. I've got the King James for this one. Or, you, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We can look at... Uh, Zacchaeus of Jericho. He was a chief tax collector for that city. This man has subordinate tax collectors from whom he received a percentage of their take. Zacchaeus was despised by his own community, not only for being corrupt, which was the common practice among tax collectors, right? but he was also a traitor to his people. He was a collaborator with the Romans. And we can apply this also to Matthew. Okay? His parents disowned him. Is that an obvious thing? Is that, ta is that taught anywhere? Yeah, it is, actually. In Scripture, uh, we can find that his lineage in full is nowhere to be found. And, it, and to find it, you have to go to very extreme sources. Okay? But all that we do know is that he was tied to the tribe of Benjamin. Imagine stepping out from your family so far that they're not even willing to have their name attached to you. Right? When Jesus passed through Jericho, Zacchaeus climbed a tree to get a glimpse of him because he, he and I were you know, vertically challenged. Right? Jesus saw him and invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. This encounter transformed Zacchaeus. He repented. He promised to give half of his possessions to the poor and repay anyone that he had cheated four times over. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3.18 also New King James on my end. But we all, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of God and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Mary of Magdalene. Okay. Mary of Magdala is often associated with, with a sinful past. Some of her previous life is, is recognized. The most damaging are extrapolated. What is clear is that she was so far into the world 
that she became possessed by seven demons. And, and this was all before she encountered Jesus. We, that's uh, Luke 8 and 2. Okay. The alleviation of this plague changed Mary's life. Jesus freed her from her torment, and she became one of the most devoted <coughs> followers. She became a faithful disciple and played a vital role in the early Christian community. All in a moment. Mary's, Mary witnessed Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. At a time when women could not testify, she was the first to be able to tell of the resurrection. And without the resurrection, we have no Christianity. Mary became arguably the most important figure in the gospel after Jesus because of that. She was the disciple Jesus selected to reveal his resurrected self to, and that is why we're here. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, tribe of Benjamin, was a Pharisee, educated by uh, Gamaliel, who was the grandson of Halal the Rav, was, was viewed uh, that the message, or did view, that the message that Jesus was trying to get across was reckless. Absolutely out of control, wrong, on multiple levels. Saul did not understand why followers of the way avoided all religious customs and traditions, or nearly all of them. Okay? All of those traditions that he knew so well, they were blatantly putting aside and instead embraced a simple faith of, the, of an itinerant preacher from the no-place area of a backward region within the empire. Saul's zealous beliefs and, and upbringing led him to become a religious extremist. In many regards, he was essentially a terrorist. You look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 27, 28, and, and you'll see what I mean. Right? He oversaw the first Christian martyrdom. Saul dragged Christian women and men from their homes and threw them in prison. They, were, they could not be charged with a capital crime of blasphemy due to the Roman occupation, but could face death for acknowledging a king other than Caesar. He was infamous for the crimes that he committed against the early church, Acts 22.4. He was an accomplice to the killing of Stephen. Throughout the entire Bible, no one personifies the dramatic change of a single encounter with the living God as Saul. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians when he was suddenly knocked off his horse. The, whole, the story is Acts 9. Okay. This encounter left him blind for three days and led to a complete change of heart. Saul became a fervent follower of Christ. Those who knew his past, as you could guess, were skeptical. Acts 9, 13, and 14 kind of, in my opinion, brushes the, the surface of that. And he changed his name to Paul. His new passion was to do God's will, which was something thought, that he thought he was doing but then with greater revelation, he realized that, he, that his life was, was supposed to build the church that he went out to destroy. But he suffered immensely to do so. Paul was beaten 
starved, imprisoned, stoned, shipwrecked, and a whole lot more. He became one of the most influential apostles, spreading the gospel throughout the northern Mediterranean basin. Eventually, he would give his life for the gospel. The letters written by the least of the apostles account for the, for the majority of the New Testament and spread the gospel, impacting uh, Western culture and societies. This Hebrew of Hebrews was called to reach the Gentiles. His actions served as a blueprint for all modern missions. This Pharisee of Pharisees taught and led the early church. What a radical change that is. One of the things that, that he taught, or how he taught in, uh, in his epistles are, are very rabbinical, in that uh, he uses the concept of, of sinar. Sinar is, um, it can be translated as, as hate or extreme negativity. Uh, but it can also be translated as a void or admonishment. The practice of, of Sina, as, as a good rabbi will, will provide, is not only what to avoid, but offer an example of what should take its place. I want to do what is right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. Romans 7.15 Anyone who belongs to Christ has, been, has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Hate, avoid, okay? what is evil, and cling to what is good. Romans 12.9. Okay? Paul the Apostle dealt strongly with believers who, uh, who caused discord within the church. He encouraged believers to ostracize habitual wrongdoers within the fellowship, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. He didn't encourage, did not encourage the same actions against those who are outside the church. Why is that? Because some of the harshest punishments described in the Bible were reserved for those who knew what was right, but still chose to disobey. Paul clarified to all people who continually do wrong that they have to be avoided leaving the treatment for non-believers to be judged by God. We deal with our own in this way, let God work on them, but as far as people outside, let, just let God deal with them. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Believers are to show love and mercy toward those outside the church, but for those who know how to act, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of, the right, of righteousness than having known it and to turn. 2 Peter 2 and 21. John chapter 20, verse 2. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to other disciples whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we do not know where they have laid him. In this verse, the Greek reads, and I've done this phonetically, so if anybody's Greek is better than mine, which would be all of you, correct me. Omatetes on Igapa o Iesus. Okay, okay, then, then, we'll, then, then we'll run with that. Igapa is a reference to unconditionally loved. Imagine that, to know, to know with such fervency that five times in Scripture, you're going to point out, I'm the one that God loves unconditionally. We're talking about the disciple that God loved. But I'm talking to the disciple, the disciples that God loves you. Amen. Each of you. Individually and corporately. Okay? 
But for this example, uh, we have Yochanan ben Zebedee by Naphtali, who is also yeah who who is also known as John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, John of Patmos, John the Elder, and the beloved disciple. We are not provided with what his burden or sin was or where his guilt came from because he was, well, he was a very young man when he was called to follow the master. Right? He was roughly 19 years old when he was called. And we, we can do theory, we can do conjecture, we can do all those wonderful things. And sometimes we have a little bit of scripture that might, mm, maybe that was part of it, maybe not. Did he consider himself the spoiled son of a wealthy man in a region of the Galilee where abject poverty was rampant? Did he see himself as a mama's boy in a rough society in a physically demanding manly job? I got his mom intervening a whole lot on his part in, well, not a whole lot, but in very big ways. Okay. According to Matthew 4, 18 through 22, Mark 1, 16 through 20, and Luke 5, 1 through 11, he fished in the Sea of Galilee. Not an easy job. I've, I've often said that there's not enough money on this planet to have me change my role to being a case manager. Well, I can also tell you there's not enough money on this planet to make me a fisherman. Fisher now, a fisher of men. <laughs> you, you asked me eight years ago, would I do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, haven't caught a full football game since. <laughs> but likewise, we each have had a burden of sin and weight of guilt before we were called to follow our master. Right. Okay? We each have spent time searching for the presence of God. We each have spent time content with simply gaining knowledge about our Father. Okay? Some people come to, come to church on Sunday. I've done my thing. I've heard about it. Going home. Okay? But we're not here to, to gain knowledge about our Father. We're, we're here to know our Father. Right? We each have been passive participants. And then someone really introduces us to Jesus. Or something happens that really lets us know that Jesus is right there. And then we're startled when we figure out that he's always been there. Okay. Starting around uh, 2013, I, I spent the better part of two years trying to figure out why in the world did I end up in New Hampshire. And now I know. This apostle heard the Baptist Point out, uh, point out Jesus as the Lamb of God. John 1, uh, 35 through 39. He was in so much need of, of reining in this, this most youthful of men that we have examples of, of Jesus kind of coming down on him really hard. Right? Uh, he went to call down fire on a hostile Samaritan town. Uh, John told Jesus that he was in, uh, involved in rebuking uh, a non-disciple for casting out demons by the power of the name. And in both cases, Jesus reprimanded him. Jesus sent John and one other into Jerusalem to make preparations for the, uh, for the final Passover Seder uh, that, that Jesus uh, led. Uh, go to John 21, 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which, was, which is also, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and saith, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? John and two others form the informal central core of the twelve apostles. 
he was presented at the raising of Yarius's daughter. He was there at the test that, at uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was there at the Transfiguration. After the arrest of Jesus, John and one other followed him to the residence of Yosef Caiaphas by Yosef. He remained at the foot of the cross following the instructions of Jesus. He took Mary under his care and protection. John 19, 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto, the, unto, his, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. John was one of the only two apostles who ran to the empty tomb after Mary uh, Magdala bore witness to the resurrection. After the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, John and one other guided the early church. John was imprisoned with Peter. He was with Peter at the healing of the lame man on Solomon's porch at the temple. John and one other went to visit the newly converted believers in Samaria. While he remained in Judea and the surrounding area, the other disciples uh, returned to Jerusalem for the Apostolic Council 48 through 50 AD. Galatians 2 recognizes John as one of the three pillars of the church. He was acclaimed for his apostolic preaching and recognized as one of the most prominent men of the early Christian community at Jerusalem. John the Apostle went on to author a gospel, three epistles, and the book of Revelation. When it comes to being transformed by God, these and other biblical examples are a great, great place to look for inspiration. Some have been changed from lives of darkness and sin into ones of righteousness and faith. May their stories encourage us to trust God's ability to change even the most broken among us. All who seek redemption can find peace in God's unending grace and transforming power. It is never too late for us to turn our lives over to the service of God. It doesn't matter what John's past was. It doesn't matter what our pasts have been for God to extend his forgiveness. God can use anyone according to his purpose, no matter how far we have fallen. If I could have the musicians, please. No matter how much our lives have been defined by sin, God's love, grace, and changing power can reach us in a space of a moment. We can be transformed into people who evangelize for his kingdom. Anyone who is struggling with sin or feeling burdened by mistakes or guilt can find forgiveness and redemption through Christ Jesus. His blood can cleanse anyone providing hope in that eternal life. Amen. Don't despair. Yes. Be strong and of good courage. Turn to Christ in repentance and ask for his forgiveness. Amen. The accounts shared, uh, shared may be centuries old, yet still give life today. Do you realize that you are the disciple whom Jesus loves? What will your story be? Will yours do the same for someone else? Will your life be a model for others? It only takes a spark to light a fire. It only takes one heart to ignite a revival. Is that heart yours? Come to the altar expectantly and leave the altar joyful. Amen. Amen.